Hello, everyone who's here already, and welcome to our presentation on tricky intersections in Greater Victoria. We'll just wait a couple more minutes until we begin fully. I just wanted to say thank you to everyone who's returning to a webinar and welcome to everyone who's coming to a new one. Usually it's Justine, our bike skills coordinator, hosting these, but Justine is on a very well-deserved vacation. So now I get to try my hand at hosting a webinar and I'm joined by three of our bike skills instructors, Lana, Hugh, and Todd, as well as Karen Labery, who's from uh, bikemaps.org. And we have a presentation. We'll take you through a couple um, intersections that have been submitted by cyclists all around the region and look at safe practices for going through those. So I see a couple people just joining us now. So we'll just wait a few minutes and then we'll begin. Thank you. While we wait, I'll copy Justine's interlude and ask if any of our presenters have done a, a noteworthy bike ride in the last couple of weeks or since our last webinar. Lana, you done anything? Karen, Todd? Uh, nothing much noteworthy, uh, although I think every ride around Victoria is kind of enjoyable. I, I lost sure. something yesterday, so I had to retrace my steps all the way down to Beacon Hill Park and came Ooh. up. You didn't find it? No. It's too bad. But one ride was first thing in the morning at 6.30 and the other ride was at about 8 in the evening. And so it's yeah. still very enjoyable going down to Beacon Hill. Good. Always is. Yes. Well, my, my wife and I did one of the scavenger hunt routes. So we did the one in Saanich on Sunday. So Oh, awesome. Yeah, it was great. We had a lot of fun and uh, she really enjoyed it. So Excellent. Did you find all the clues? We did, we did eventually, so. <laughs> awesome. All right, I see a couple more people have joined us, so I think we're ready to officially begin. For those just joining us, welcome to our Tricky Intersections in Greater Victoria webinar, where we look at, or we take submissions from local cyclists and then put our crack team of um, bicycle instructors on the case of solving how to get through them safely and comfortably. And we're also pleased to share research from Karen Labry, the executive director of bikemaps.org, looking at cycling safety hotspots in the region. We're very pleased to be able to present that. I believe this is our eighth webinar in our series of online bike skills webinars. Uh, they were started as a response to COVID-19 and not being able to do our regular bike skills courses. Uh, and thanks for everyone who's returning to another great webinar and thanks for everyone who's joining us for the first time. My name is James Coates. I'm the program assistant for the Bike to Work Society. I'm filling in for our great bike skills coordinator, Justine, who's away on vacation this week. So today we're um, discussing tricky intersections in Greater Victoria, and we have three of our bike skills instructors joining us today. Lana Taves, who I think holds the, there it goes already. I was gonna say, for those watching at home, place your bets on when the sign behind me that I crudely taped up will fall, and it's fallen already. Anyways, Lana Taves is our bike skills, uh, one of our bike skills instructors, and I think she holds the record for attending the most webinars as a panelist. We also have Todd Kalinuk, another bike skills presenter, and Hugh Wallace. And we're also joined by Karen from bikemaps.org. So our webinar should last about 40 minutes, and we will have time for questions at the end. You can ask questions in the question tab, which is on the sidebar, which you'll see on your screen. And hopefully we can get to those at the end. Um, if you have any technical difficulties, I recommend uh, closing the program and then reopening it with the email link that you originally joined with. And if you miss anything, this entire webinar is recorded and will be available later. And for those just joining us, welcome once again to the Bike to Work Society's webinar on navigating tricky intersections in Greater Victoria. So first I will introduce Karen, the executive director of bikemaps.org, which for those who don't know, is a great resource where cyclists can report any uh, collisions, near misses, falls that they have while cycling and uh, see a map of the entire world of self-reported data. It's really easy to use. I've used it before, luckily for not for anything too bad, so Karen will tell you more about bike maps and take you around some cycling safety hotspots in the city. And Karen, you are now the presenter. Okay. Show my screen. 
There we go. All right, thank you for having me. Um, I'm excited to be here to show some of our recent work. Um, and big thank you to everyone who has contributed data to bikemaps.org. So some background, um, cycling data are limited and what that is from is um, official crash data such as that that's collected by ICBC. Um, it's, it's estimated that less than 30% of all collisions between people on a bike and people driving vehicles are captured by ICBC. Um, as well, there's police data that can capture um, bicycling collisions with vehicles, but this is really inconsistent from city to city and it's quite challenging to access. Uh, we also can learn uh, about cycling uh, safety from hospital administration data, but it can also be quite inconsistent and it would lack the finer details of, you know, where where did these incidents happen and, and accessing it is also quite challenging. As well, there is no capacity for near miss reporting. And then what happens when you have a fall or you crash into infrastructure or those other types of situations? Um, finally, some of the official data, when they, um, they collect the location, it gets snapped to either the intersection or the mid block. So the actual location of the, the incident, it, it's not right. It's not uh, actually where, where the, the problem happens. Um, finally, uh, ICBC data in particular can take several years to see the light of day. So it's, it's not terribly useful if you're trying to monitor situations in real time. So, um, because the official data is quite problematic, um, back in 2014, um, Trislin Nelson, who was a professor in the geography department at UVic, was riding up to UVic on Cadro Bay Road and had a near miss in this very location and thought to herself, I think it would be a good idea to make a map where people can report all these, these problematic locations. And, and that's how bikemaps.org was born. Her idea kind of came on the cusp of, of this uh, growing field of volunteer geographic information, and which is sort of a branch of citizen science. So really tapping into people's experiences to collect data, to fill in missing data gaps. So for those of you not familiar with bikemaps.org, it allows you to report falls, which we know from other researchers such as Kay Teschke, um, these can result in uh, quite serious uh, health issues. Um, you can report collisions with motor vehicles, of course, but with other bikes and pedestrians and animals uh, such as deer. You can report collisions with tracks, bollards, curbs, potholes, um, you name it. As well, you can report near misses. So if you came really close to having a collision, um, you can certainly put that on the map and be proactive. Um, you can do this at any time and then the, the data is of all, you know, it's ready to go. It's on the map in real time for other people to see. As well, we would encourage you if you see somebody else almost get, you know, hit by a vehicle while they're riding their bike, for example, please report it as a witness. So, of course, you can go on the website bikemaps.org and report, but we also have mobile apps that were developed by our former uh, master student, Darren Boss. And the type of data that we collect on bikemaps.org is actually quite rich. So we have people uh, fill in a detailed description. And so that really gives you an idea of what's happening or what their issue was at that particular location. In addition to that, and this is something that you can't see on the map, but we collect it in the back end. We ask questions about injury. We ask questions about the weather conditions, but we also scrape the weather in the background. Um, so for that particular location at that date and time, what was the weather at that location? We asked about direction of travel, uh, what type of infrastructure you were riding on, and what the visibility was like. So from the data that we collect on bikemaps.org, one of the things that we like to do is to combine it with the official data. Um, and so we've done this a number of times in the past. We've done it for the Capital Regional District. We've done it specifically for Saanich a number of times. Um, and so we've just come up actually with a recent map with um, 
the ICBC data that was released last year, and it went, goes from 2014 to 2017. And um, we combined that data with the near misses, falls, and collisions that were captured on bikemaps.org for the entire Capital Regional District. And so this map was created by um, Cole Glover, and it shows you all the hot spots throughout the, the Capital Region. So this is the first time um, most people are seeing this map. So we're just releasing it pretty much today. Um, I will put it up on our blog. Um, if you want to have a closer look at it. And so for each of these different hotspots, we have some information from what we've been able to uh, assess from our bikemaps.org reports. Um, the ICBC reports don't really give us any information. We just have a general location, but together with the bikemaps.org reports, we can get a pretty good sense of what the issue is at these particular locations. So a couple of the uh, hotspots that I'm going to highlight, and they're not necessarily the hottest hotspots, they're just different ones that I think people um, should be aware of. And you'll note that all the hotspots that I'm, I'm talking about are actually aren't at intersections, they're at um, other locations. And um, so this one that's come up is on Interurban Road and um, there's a bike lane before and after uh, this little bridge over the Colquitts River. And so what happen, ends up happening here is the, you know, the cyclist needs to take the lane, but this seems to con confuse drivers to no end as to where they're supposed to go and who's supposed to go at what time. So this is definitely um, a conflict zone. Another spot that we get a lot of reports on is up in Saanich in uh, the Mackenzie area by the Tuscany Village and um, the University Heights Mall. Um, so there's a number of driveways into gas stations, into the two different uh, you know, shopping centers, and these provide quite, um, quite a lot of conflicts between cyclists in the painted bike lane and drivers entering or exiting um, these commercial lots. Uh, particularly the gas station seems to be, uh, a, there's two gas stations, one on either side of Shelburne, um, and they seem to be uh, quite problematic for drivers entering and exiting and, and, and the vehicles, or sorry, the bikes in the bike lane. So as you can see from this description here, um, person was, whoops, sorry. Uh, am I showing my screen? Yes, okay. Um, so as you can see, um, the person was uh, coming along in the bike lane and uh, somebody decided to turn into the uh, gas station at the last second and the, the person on the bike was knocked off. So the next hotspot I want to draw your attention to is the one on, it's pretty much the whole length of Cook Street. Um, there's just a lot going on here. Uh, the people complain about insufficient room for both cyclists and motor vehicles. There's a lot of close passes and squeezing. Um, this seems to create aggressive driving. The drivers don't really know what to do with the bicycles. Um, and there's some doorings course there's right hooks and left turning vehicles um, and so you see when when there's a road and which doesn't have um, a specific infrastructure for a cyclist it, sometimes it's hard to know what to do especially if you're a, a newer person riding a bicycle so in this case um, the person reported that there were many parked cars in a median in the middle of the road so I was trying to stay as close to the side of the road as possible so that cars would be able to get past me very nice, but um, I get, you know, I got too close to a parked car and my handlebar clipped the side mirror and I flew off my bike and into the street. So that gives you an indication of, you know, some of the hotspots that we see on bikemaps.org. Um, so one of the, the things that we 
we really like to see is that when hotspots get fixed. So one of our favorite ones is um, when we did our first hotspot map for Saanich back in uh, 2016 at the start of their 30 year active transportation plan. Uh, one of the really hottest hotspots was where the Galloping Goose crossed Harriet Road. And, um, and they were able to use this information to just simply close access to Highway 1 from uh, Harriet. And it was just, it was kind of an easy fix for them to do. And it really, you know, had great benefit for trail users. So some of the other, um, in some of the other things that we've been doing with the information collected on uh, bikemaps.org is to actually do, um, you know, academic research with the information. And so, I'm really excited to share with you this uh, paper that was led by Jamie Fisher, who's a PhD student in Dr. Megan Winter's lab. Um, some of you are familiar with Jamie if you've done the CRD bike counts. Um, she helps organize those. So she led this paper and it should be out very soon and, and it will be open access so you can really dig into it. But um, Jamie looked at all the collision reports in the CRD on bikemaps.org to see which ones were associated with people um, requiring uh, medical treatment for an injury. And in the CRD, of the incidents reported to bikemaps.org, so of the collision reports, um, left turn vehicles were most often associated with uh, a cyclist needing to seek medical attention for an injury. And the following the left turning vehicles um, was train tracks and collisions with deer. So, so that's which is a very uh, a very Victoria specific type of incident. We don't find that anywhere else. Another thing I want to sort of bring up quickly is that um, exposure is important. So, if you remember early a few several slides ago when I was showing the hotspot map. The downtown core lit up like a Christmas tree. Well, part of that is because we have a lot of people riding in the downtown core. And that doesn't mean that anywhere that people are reporting on bikemaps.org is dangerous. What it means is that this is where there's a lot of people riding and this is some things that could still be tweaked. And so it brings up the idea of burden versus risk. So it's important to, to fix those areas where there's a lot of people bicycling because it impacts a lot of people. But if we want to look at actual risk on a per trip basis, we need a really good idea of ridership. So, and it, that needs to be continuous through space and time. So some of the work that our research team has been looking at is using uh, Strava data, which is an app that, you know, a lot of people doing recreational or sport rides use, but people also use it for commuting. And we can bias correct it so it's not as uh, representative of just the sports cyclists. We can use um, automatic, automated counters um, and also manual counts to bias correct it. And so some of the research done um, by uh, Dr. Colin Furster and our team, he's done this for Ottawa. And this is because Ottawa has got a really good uh, so they've got really great eco counter coverage and some really great open data from their city. And in the first panel, you see this is where all the incidents are. Um, panel B is where people like to ride, so the blue areas. And so if you take panel A, divide through by panel B, you get you suddenly different hotspots come up. So in panel A, the Laurier bike. Uh, Laurier Avenue bike lane, which is a protected bike lane, was really quite hot. But when you divide through by the number of people actually riding it, and if you want to see where the riskiest place per trip, well, suddenly it comes up on Bronson Avenue, which I'm, for those of you who don't know Ottawa is, you know, there's Sharon's. So, so this is quite, uh, quite interesting. So this, I think you have to keep this in mind when you're looking at the bike maps .org data. Don't avoid places because there's incidents, just uh, use that information. So my final plug will just be to encourage you to report on bike maps if you've had a near miss or a fall or a collision. Um, you know, it's it, it's only going to take you a minute or two, and then uh, we have this information to pass on to municipalities, pass on, pass on to 
uh, advocates and to, that we can use for our research. And so this is just a snapshot of our team. Uh, I'm certainly not, not alone in this endeavor. You know, we have a great team um, out of Victoria, Vancouver, Arizona, uh, St. John's. And um, we've been really fortunate to have a lot of support to move this research forward. So thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Karen. Yeah, I encourage everyone attending here if they haven't already to check out bikemaps.org because it's not only good to report your own accidents or near misses, which hopefully you don't have, but great to look at the map and see what other people have reported. And there's not just data for Victoria, there's data from all around the world. So thank you very much. And Karen, a lot of what you mentioned will be, will be talked about by other presenters like train tracks. I think a lot of people might be surprised that that's the second largest cause of collisions. Uh, Todd, some of Todd's intersections will discuss how to properly ride over train tracks. And I think a lot of our attendees, myself included, are surprised that deer are um, the third leading cause of collisions. So, of injury. injury. Of injury, not collisions, yeah. yes. Thank you. So watch out for deer out there. Thank you, Karen. All right, now we'll go over to Lana, who will discuss some uh, intersections predominantly in the downtown core on protected bike lanes and how best to cycle through those. Excellent. Take it away, Lana. Hello. Can you hear me? We can, yeah. Great. Okay, I just need to get fully set up here. Um, can you see what? Can you see my slide? Uh, yes, but we can still see your notes as well. Okay, that's what I'm trying to avoid. How's that look? Uh, you want to change your display to the okay. other screen. Always happens. How's that? Excellent. Great. Yay. Okay, thank you so much, Karen. That is uh, such an interesting presentation. Uh, I'm going to uh, start off the next uh, section with um, the tricky intersections that people from the community have submitted to us. Uh, myself and then Todd and then Hugh will each be tackling a few of these. And um, I think without further ado, I'm just going to charge right into it because uh, we're going to try and cover as many as we can. So let us, I'll just note that I actually have been with the Society, this is my sixth season as an instructor, and we're looking forward to very soon getting out on the road again and um, resuming our bike skills courses. They're probably going to be a hybrid format, a little bit online and a little bit uh, on the road. So we have re received quite a few questions about the Pandora two-way bike lanes, asking how to turn on and off the bike lanes and cross Pandora. So the, the six block corridor is considered an all ages and abilities facility, so triple A, meaning the cycle track is physically separated from the roadway by raised curbs or painted with buffers and bollards. So you're, you're separated from traffic. There's also Fort Street, and Wharf Humble have uh, separated bike lanes as well, and more to come this year. To understand how to safely use these bike lanes, it, it helps to be familiar with the features specific to these facilities. So just pointing out a few things, there are bicycle specific traffic lights. Uh, if you're using the cycle track, follow these. Uh, cyclists, important to note, can still ride on the main roadway. You are not required to be in the cycle track. If that's the case, then um, use the green ball light. Um, another feature is that vehicles can no longer turn right at red along Pandora. They can no longer turn right onto Pandora. At this point, most vehicles are still familiar with that, but this, this can still cause a uh, bump of the cyclists. And then I'm also gonna note the green caution or conflict paint, because it calls it conflict paint. And this paint, signifies areas where motorists and cyclists need to pay the most attention to one another because cyclists and vehicles can be in that same area. So there's a lot of green paint at intersections and at driveway entrances. So we're going to start at the intersection of Pandora and Cook where the two-way lanes start and end. 
depending on your perspective. And here we have the old Wellburns market at the northwest corner. A few more features to note here. So there are raised mid-block crosswalks. I'll point out that these little triangles actually are warnings, they're indicators that, that it's raised. There are also bus stops on the median. And so this results in high congestion areas uh, and the need to always yield to pedestrians who may or may not cross the crosswalks and the need to control your speed on these facilities. So we can also see that the cycle track is running alongside the crosswalk and it's marked with green caution paint. It also has these dotted white lines, and those are called elephant's feet. And those indicate that it is a bicycle crossing. So a bike can cross, a cyclist can cross without dismounting. There are also what's called bike turn boxes. Green paint at the intersection and another bike box, bike turn box right within the bike lanes. And these are used when performing a two-stage turn. And we'll return to those in just a moment. Uh, it's important to note that at intersections, the road intersections with the bike turn box, the stop bar is here. And you can see that the vehicles actually stop there. Uh, and important that vehicles stop there so that cyclists can use those boxes when they're turning. When the light is red, of course. So here's a street view looking east. On the west side of the intersection. And what you'll notice is that if you're heading east, this bike lane now ends. And you essentially have to turn left or right at the intersection. So let's look at a left hand turn. Uh, if you're turning left, straight forward. Signal your intent and turn. So you're riding along here. You're waiting for your bike light and for pedestrians to clear the intersection or the crosswalk, and then you turn and then we go to the right. Straightforward. Now, if you are wanting to turn right onto Cook Street from the bike lane, uh, you'll want to do a two-stage turn, it's safest. So the idea of the two-stage turn is to make two turns and avoid or minimize turning across traffic. Uh, it can take a little bit longer, but it's quite safe. So I'm going to use my marker again and show, so you want to turn right ultimately, as you can see over here. The first thing you're going to do is wait for the light to turn, signal your intention, and you're actually turning left, so you would signal left. Ride through when it's clear. Turn your bike around a little U-turn. Wait for the light on cook to turn green. And then the second step is to proceed through the intersection. There's your two-stage turn. So the next intersection continuing left, west along Pandora is to Douglas Street. Uh, we can see City Hall at the northwest corner. And we have a question from Janice and Mark about how to turn left onto Douglas Street um, from the bike lane. This involves a two stage turn. Question how to turn left. Uh, a two stage left hand turn. And this is what it looks like. So now you are, you are going. West along Pandora, you wait for the light to turn green, the bicycle light, and you signal your intention. Right signal is your first movement. Wait for pedestrians to clear. You've got a great big bike box here. Move into this area, align your bike facing forward. Watch if there's other cyclists in the box. Watch for their uh, turning signals to indicate where they're going. And when the light turns green, you can proceed through, that looks like that's the bike lane there, two stage. I'll note that confident cyclists are still permitted to do a standard left hand turn, uh, just using the lane. So uh, what they have to do is wait for all the traffic to pass. And you have to ride further into the intersection, like this, to get through. 
So the two-stage turn essentially allows you to um, do a very safe crossing. Okay, so here is a street view of the same two-stage left turn. Uh, in the first image here, a cyclist westbound in Pandora is turning into, right here, she's turning into the turn box. She's oriented to her bike to go down Douglas, waits for the light on Douglas, and proceeds across the intersection. If anyone is feeling completely confused about how to do a two-stage turn, I encourage you to visit the City of Victoria website where they have some short video tutorials um, and look for the cycling tab and click on Pandora Avenue. That is the only place where you can see these videos. So what if you are southbound on Douglas and you want to turn left to enter the Pandora bike lane? You want to do that kind of turn. So another two-stage left-hand turn. The situation is a little bit different here because the bike box that you're turning into is in the bike lane. It's a little bit smaller. It's actually quite a bit smaller. So the note here is if you're riding a larger bike with a bigger turning radius, a cargo bike, uh, you're towing a trailer, it might be impossible with a trailer, um, even a cruiser or a comfort bike, which has a pretty large turning radius, you could have a hard time turning in this tight space. So this is that same turn. It's a street view from the north side of Douglas. So uh, just a note here about road positioning. If you are wanting to make this turn, you can see that there's a bike lane here. Um, but if you want to do a two-stage turn going left, your first turn is the right-hand turn. And so you'd want to actually move over into the right turn lane to make your two-stage left-hand turn. So I'm just going to grab my marker, my highlighter. So uh, as I said, there's a bike lane here, but go into the right-hand turn lane, signal your intention to turn right, tight turn in the turn box, wait for the green light, second stage turn, or go straight through the intersection. All right. Enough on two stage turns. So let's go to the other end or start of the bike lanes. Allie asked about warp intersection, didn't mention a cross street. So I chose Pandora at Wharf and Store because there is a lot going on here. The Johnson Street Bridge opened in early 2018. It has painted bike lanes in both directions. It has a separated multi use or shared pathway on the east side and then a separated pedestrian walkway on the west side. And just a note about this image, all the other photos or overheads that I've shown um, have north at the top of the page. This one, because I'm using a city of Victoria diagram, has uh, west at the top. In case you're wondering what orientation. So the bridge is up here. Um, and also this overhead photo courtesy of Google is quite out of date. Um, so I'm using this schematic from the city of Victoria. And uh, we're going to look at navigation issues for cyclists westbound, about to exit the cycle track, the cycle track. So right down here where my cursor is. And there's essentially four options. One is to ride across the elephant's feet bike crossing and go right onto Janion Plaza and the shared pathway section of the bridge, across the bridge. Second option is to ride across Elephant Speed Crosswalk, uh, but this time stay on the road and connect to the westbound bike lane on the bridge deck, shown by this dotted line. Third option you might have is to ride across and turn left to access the Wharf Street two-way bike lanes, southbound, as that area indicates. And then there is a fourth option as well, which is turning right onto Store Street. So let's, um, what I want to do is just have some observations about this intersection. Uh, so you can't fully see it here, but the, actually that's not, um, 
the pedestrian and bicycle signals are now automatic. So these are all out of order. Forgive me. Um, so there are pedestrian controls or bike controls that you used to have to push, and now you don't have to push them. Um, as I've circled here, um, if you are using the bike crossing, the elephant's foot crossing, uh, you want to be proceeding through on the green uh, bike light. What I observe is a lot of uh, cyclists, they wait for a little bit and then they seem to get a little bit impatient. The pedestrian cross comes on, pedestrian light, and cyclists either ride across the uh, elephant's feet or they ride across the crosswalk. They don't, they don't wait. Um, the other thing that we note here is that uh, Janion Plaza over on this side of the intersection, it has a lot of people, often a lot of people walking, and people on bikes, and they're going many different directions. So it's really important here to travel slowly, respectfully, use your voice and your bell, and always yield to pedestrians. And also remember that there's a lot of tourists, usually in most years, a lot of tourists who probably aren't familiar with the infrastructure here. Uh, so, let's see what else we have here. Okay, just wait. I wanted to say um, if cyclists are electing to ride on the bridge on the roadway, there's this little island here that they must navigate around. It's a little bit unclear whether they should go on the right side or the left side, as far as I can tell. And so, of course, you see cyclists doing both. Um, which, which again can cause some uncertainty, especially for cyclists who are crossing and wanting to turn left and access the Wharf Street bike lanes. And they have this little um, holding area to wait for the lights. So it can get quite congested because these are really quite small spaces. Uh, another thing that I wanted to note is that um, when you are in this area, you want to watch for oncoming pedestrians or cyclists actually from Janine Plaza that are turning left on Wharf Street. Uh, and they may be more focused on navigating a sharp right turn through these series of bollards. I've actually seen people try and turn and, and hit the bollards. And I should be a witness and report that I've seen people hit them and fall off their bike. And um, so the last option that I wanted to talk about was cyclists turning, oh, that's where the pedestrian button is now working automatically, but I wanted to look at pedestrians turning right onto Store Street, and what seems interesting here is that rather than signal right and turn right onto Store Street, many ride across the intersection, they ride across here, They've just come off the, or maybe over here, they come off the Pandora bike track and uh, they end up in the Janion Plaza and they turn right and just proceed on the sidewalk. And perhaps people aren't familiar with Victoria or they're riding along the protected bike lanes and they're into a bit of autopilot, uh, but uh, I see few people signal and turn. And this could also possibly be that there is a, a large curb bolt right here at the corner. Um, this creates more space for pedestrians, but the road lane is very narrow. There's not enough room for car and cyclists, and so the cyclist needs to take the lane, and perhaps this is intimidating if, they, if the reason that they're riding downtown at all is because of having these facilities. So, so I think what I see is uh, some some issues when cycling infrastructure, a lot of high quality cycling infrastructure, suddenly ends. That's what I want to say there. So, let's continue along Wharf Street over to government. And we have a great question from Wanda who asks How do you use the bike lane for work found on government? I think it's a great question because often navigating through an intersection without turning is straightforward, but not always, as is demonstrated here. 
So we can see that there's a bike lane on government comes in by the Empress. If you stay in the bike lane, if you stay in the bike lane, what's going to happen is you will enter the Wharf Humboldt two-way bike lane. And basically you can turn left or you can turn right. If you continue northbound, you enter the pedestrian scramble over here. And uh, you can go through there as a cyclist, but of course you're going to have to dismount and walk your bike. So the best way to negotiate this intersection as a cyclist going northbound is to merge into the vehicle lane um, right about here, dotted line. And build some arrow here, right there. And proceed through the intersection when the traffic light is green. So a note on road positioning that I wanted to make is uh, what you what you don't want to do is ride up on the right over here and pass these vehicles if the light is red, unless they are signaling that they're about to turn left. But it's safer to take the lane and wait behind the vehicle that's in front of you. Um, and this is because if you ride up the lane and you go through the intersection, on the other side of the intersection, you'll meet a curb, and then you're going to urgently need to merge back into the lane of traffic. And the final note that I want to say here is that uh, Government Street right now, good thing, is expanded for pedestrian use. It's closed to vehicle traffic, and cyclists are required to dismount. There isn't a sign, an explicit sign, until you reach Fort Street. So if you are going through, uh, you need to walk your bike once you get through the intersection. And the last intersection that I'm going to talk about is, I think, another great question from Jennifer, who is asking about the correct way to navigate going west on Pandora, one-way street, where Begbie merges into Pandora. There's Begbie, there's Pandora, Johnson Street as well. And I think this is a, a, a great option. I wasn't very familiar with this intersection. And what I really like about this is there's an excellent option for cyclists to safely get across to Begbie before it merges into Pandora. Um, there's a shared pathway right here. There's signage here and an elephant's feet crosswalk here and over here so that the cyclists can ride over Beg over Begbie. And what I really like about this is, is that, is that it, I, I think that it really encourages cyclists to take a very safe route because they can keep riding and not get off their bikes. So here you can almost see, there's two signs that indicate it's a shared pathway and the elephants think you can ride across. There is another way to do this intersection, option B, which is to do a vehicular merge. And so we're looking um, east back along Pandora. So the, the bank crossing that I showed you was here. Um, you can just ride through and merge in here, right? Signal and merge. The picture that I've shown is, is just great because you may not want to do that um, at certain times of day, uh, on certain days, at, uh, you know, depending on the weather. Um, but if you navigate this intersection regularly, I can imagine that there are times when you would use both. I went by here the other day and I saw a cyclist do the vehicular merge. There was no traffic. Uh, it made perfect sense to, to do it in that approach. But this is super safe and it's super um, effective, given that cyclist doesn't need to get off their bike. And that was all I had to say for my Great. intersections. Thank you very much, Lana. I think that's a lot of useful tips for, for all of us, myself included. Uh, great ways to take advantage of some of the, the AAA infrastructure downtown. Thank you very much. All right, in the interest of time, I'm gonna go right along to Todd, who has also taken submissions from some local cyclists to discuss uh, intersections. And 
If I click the right button, I will make Todd the presenter. Thank you, Lana. Great, thank you very much. Oh, super. Uh, so I've got uh, three intersections today, but in the interest of time, I'll really just talk to the first two of them. Uh, one of the most confusing intersections in the whole city is probably where the uh, e n Rail Trail, which is an awesome piece of, uh, of shared infrastructure, uh, crosses Admiral's Road, uh, just over by the entrance to the uh, Naden Navy Base. So uh, what I'm showing here is a series of steps. So if you're riding from downtown towards the West Shore, uh, you would come along to point number one here, and that's where you just start to get towards the um, uh, towards the intersection of Colville and Admirals. Now, the safest way to get across here really is to use your superpower <laughs> and convert from a cyclist into a pedestrian. And so when you kind of get to the edge of the, uh, the road around uh, a number two there, uh, you can dismount and go up onto the traffic island, which is shown as a point number two. Uh, then the from there, you would go and uh, wait for the light to, uh, for a walk light. And then you could go across the traffic island to uh, number three. And then once again, you could wait at um, that traffic island. And once you got the walk light, go across to number four. And um, definitely the safest way to do it, confident cyclists may look ways to do it, but if you wanna be super safe, this is definitely the best approach. Uh, the other thing I will mention here is, uh, com relative to what Karen said, is you're actually crossing railroad tracks twice at this intersection. Uh, if you go from kind of two to three on foot, then at least one of the crossings is safer. Uh, now, when you get across to uh, uh, towards point number five there, you can get back on your bike and start riding again. And then you go and cross the railroad tracks again at point number five. Uh, at that point, you got to be super, super careful to make sure that you're crossing at a 90 degree angle. And anytime you see railway tracks, the only safe way to do it is to cross at a 90 degree angle. So encourage people to be extremely careful. And then once you get across from uh, number five and you're moving towards number six, uh, again, you can um, just make the left hand turn and continue on on the rail trail. A uh, great piece of infrastructure, but this is definitely a, a very, very tricky intersection. And anytime you have kind of four or five way intersections and a railroad track, you do have to be very careful in how you're doing it. Now, if you're going in the opposite direction, essentially you would just really retrace these steps. So it's very similar in going in at both directions. And again, whenever you're crossing railroad tracks, please be very careful to go at 90 degrees. Uh, here's a couple of pictures of how that looks like. So again, if you're coming from downtown, you get to point number one. Again, you can dismount your bike and walk to the traffic island to get to point number two. Uh, or you could continue riding down the uh, green uh, bicycle path to get that far and dismount at the traffic island. Uh, they would both be legal. Uh, and then when you get to point number two, then you would cross again to get to point number three. And in these intersections, you'll notice that there's no elephant speed. So it's not uh, legal to ride across from two to point three or point three to point four. Uh, you really do have to get off and walk your bikes at those intersections to be safe. Then to complete the third part of it, uh, from four to again, uh, one more walking intersection to get across to the continuation of the trail. Uh, then you could get back on your bike at point number five, again, be super careful to make sure that you're crossing that railroad track at a 90 degree angle, especially if it's raining. That would be one of the times when the railroad tracks are dangerous, but they're even more dangerous in wet weather. And again, that could definitely be a little bit tricky there. The next one where the problems is being another one where we have railroad The e Rail Trail uh, where it merges to a Squimalt Road. And uh, so if we're coming back in the other direction now from uh, the West Shore towards downtown, uh, we can see the uh, bell uh, comes from point number one. And again, as you're going along there, there's a stop sign along the trail uh, right by the Top Dog Salon. At that safest to get off of your bike and to walk to point number two, uh, push the button uh, to get a walk signal to go across that intersection 
and go for number two to point number three. Uh, you will notice in this case that there are also elephant's feet, so you can start riding at point number two. And again, that would be uh, perfectly legal and uh, in this case, I think also quite safe. Now, when you get to point number three, you can get back on your bike and start riding in the bike lane. Uh, again, as you can see here, it starts out quite, uh, uh, quite straightforward. But then when you get to point number four, it sort of dog legs over to the right. And then you get to point number five. And uh, from point number five, you go and cross the railroad track. And again, here, very important to follow the dog leg. And again, once uh, uh, again, make sure that you're crossing at a 90 degree angle because that really is the only safe way to cross railroad tracks and uh, so, so easy to lose your footing and uh, get knocked off your bike if your wheel catches the track instead of going straight across. Now, in the other direction, this is much more straightforward. Uh, so if you're coming down the trail from downtown, uh, there is another zigzag in the green paint to make sure that you're crossing the rail at a 90 degree angle. Uh, but again, once you pass that, uh, then you can make a left-hand turn toward point number one and get back onto the uh, trail at that point uh, without having to uh, cross the road again or uh, wait for additional traffic signals. And then the third one here I'll uh, just mention, I do also have some directions for how to cross the Galloping Goose Trail at uh, Souk Road in Langford. Uh, in my mind, this is one of the very dangerous crossings because uh, you don't have any visibility to the cars on Souk Road in either direction. And also they tend to speed very aggressively in that section. So again, I have some directions here. Uh, the safe way to do it is to kind of go around the uh, Willowin feed store, again, to cross at a pedestrian crossing, and then to uh, resume on the opposite side of the road at that point. And uh, we'll post these slides for people to take a look at, but there's some illustrations from uh, Google Street View on how you can safely uh, uh, safely get through that intersection. So thanks, and now I'll pass it along to Hugh. Great, thank you so much, Todd. Yeah, thanks. railroad tracks, I've certainly had friends who have encountered those badly, and you do def definitely do not want to crash on a railroad track. But now I will pass it over to Hugh. Just one moment. Uh, look at going forward. This is the uh, view you'd have towards Van City as you're coming along Finlayson from the west. You can see you're in a bike lane um, and if you follow that bike lane you'll run right out of lane on the far side of Douglas Street. Um, so first way to avoid that and, and the more uh, cycling oriented I guess is to move into the lane with the traffic in advance of getting to the end of this lane so you don't surprise anybody with trying to merge during it, the intersection. Um, that merge is helped by the fact that you're coming downhill at that point and you've uh, gained quite a bit of speed. You could easily be going 30 kilometers an hour or more. So it's not difficult to merge with the traffic, travel through the intersection and then past Van City and over into the bike lane. Uh, that's what I did once I eventually figured it out. If uh, you were a more timid cyclist or the conditions were particularly bad, you might want to consider dismounting when you get to Douglas crossing at the crosswalk as a pedestrian, walking the first 50 meters and then resuming your ride along the bike lane the rest of the way. And uh, that really is the only difficulty on that bike lane Let's have a look at uh, next slide. And this is going to be, we're going two slides. Here we are. Hillside and Shelburne is what we're going to look at. And Hillside and Shelburne. Shelburne has um, bike lanes you can see in the top part of the slide going uh, both north and south on on the on the road alongside Mayfair Mall on your left um, and a gas station and apartment buildings on the right. If you look uh, south of Shelburne there are no comparable bike lanes. So 
So if you're coming north, you're going from no bike lane to having a bike lane. That's a nice thing. But if you're coming south, you're coming from a bike lane to no bike lane. And we'll look at the difficulties associated with that in a minute. Um, going east and west along hillside, uh, you do have bike lane available to you and it's continuous. So, you know, it presents basically no, no major difficulties. Now, if we look south on Shelburne, we're in the bike lane on the right. Imagine we want to go straight uh, through the intersection. Basically, we're about to share the space of one car lane with cars and ourselves on the south side of that intersection. And we will also get into driveways that go into the commercial facilities that you can see on the far corner. So there's a lot of traffic in and out of that little uh, pharmacy plaza and beyond it, there's several other driveways. Uh, it's quite doable, but it's, the solution is very much like Finlayson. Um, you're better off to move out of the bike lane into the traffic lane, the one just to the left, um, and to travel as a vehicle at least for through the intersection and the first half block or so. And then there's usually a, kind of a parked car lane beyond that. And it's possible to travel along. Um, it's not a terribly pleasant piece of road to ride. So my second solution um, is really to avoid the whole thing. If you turn right at this intersection, instead of trying to proceed straight, you turn right into a bike lane, you go up a block or maybe two blocks and you go across one of the crosswalks that are pedestrian controlled and you enter into several very quiet continuous streets that go down as far as Bay Street and allow you to find other ways to head towards the south and downtown rather than share Shelburne. Eventually Shelburne is going to be upgraded uh, to be a bike friendly route all the way through, but that will take some time. And until then you have my two suggestions. One is take the lane. Second is turn right and avoid the whole thing. And the last intersection we're gonna look at is probably the most complicated intersection in Victoria. <clears throat> Depending on how you count, you'll reach a number that approaches about eight different streams of traffic coming through this intersection at Hillside and Douglas. So Hillside essentially ends as a major thoroughfare coming in from the right, which is coming from the east, and swings onto Gorge Road. The old part of Hillside, I'm not even really counting in this because you can't access it from the intersection. Government Street is coming from the south uh, and converging with Douglas. So you can see the part at the bottom where, the, where there's a truck parked at the intersection. That's government swinging into Douglas and allowing you to turn onto Hillside or turn left onto Douglas. And each of these... Uh, to each of several of the streets have secondary little prongs that, that are aimed at right turners. Um, the complexity is pretty high if you're trying to cycle through these intersections. So this time I'm gonna reverse the order of my solutions. The only thing that's good about this from a cyclist's perspective is that there's bike lanes coming from the south on government. Uh, not going here is probably the best solution. Find your way a block to the east uh, over to Blanchard Street and there's continuous north-south bike lanes and avoid Douglas. Or find your way to the west half a kilometer and get onto the Galloping Goose and avoid the whole thing. But if you must, and we'll talk about one of the hardest turns probably through this intersection. This is coming in from government approximately northbound. We're going to end up being northbound if we turn left on Douglas. So the truck in the left lane is must turn left. The truck in the right lane has the choice of turning left beside the white truck or turning slightly right and heading up hillside. So if you are in the right hand lane, which you can see the, is painted green here, and you're going to go left, then you potentially have vehicles on your left that want to go either left or straight, which is a real big potential conflict for you. 
So to avoid that conflict, we have a bike box here, the green painted box that happens to be fully occupied by a truck. We assume this truck is moving because the other truck is also into the intersection. So at the beginning of the light cycle, all the cyclists would be in that bike box and they would have the ability to move ahead of the traffic, turning left onto Douglas going north. And I emphasize, Douglas going north is not a place I would choose to be unless I had an important reason to be there. So instead, I would find a way to go one block east to Blanchard and head north on Blanchard with the bike lane. So just to wrap it up, I'll say that we've I've suggested solutions in each case that involve traveling like a vehicle, which takes a certain amount of ex experience and confidence, or traveling like a pedestrian to avoid the problem, or planning your route you know, in such a way as to avoid the trickiest intersections. And in my opinion, as a cycling instructor, that's a good survival strategy. It's not about being afraid or anything like that. It's about being wise and deciding when, when to put yourself out there. So James, I'll turn it back to you. Excellent, thank you so much, Hugh. I would definitely uh, echo your statement saying that oftentimes taking the lane is safer as it makes you um, more visible to other road users, but at the same time, it also takes a lot of confidence and um, certainly feels pretty scary when you're on the road with cars zooming past you. So thank you for looking at those intersections. And now, and thank you for joining me to re-record this session. Now we will turn it back over to our previously recorded session um, for a Q&A. Thank you. Um, I encourage you to ask any questions you might have in the question box on the side. And we might not be able to speak to specific intersections, but we can certainly answer questions on those we've talked about or any other bike skills questions you may have. So one question we have, which I believe I will throw to Lana is, let me find it here. If a cyclist is at an intersection with no bike lane, and but there are traffic lights, is it legal for them to take the lane and make a left turn at that intersection, or do they have to dismount and cross at the crosswalk? Great question. So just to make sure I know what they're asking, they're at an intersection, a signalized intersection, there's no bike lane, there's a light, they want to turn left, can they yeah. take the lane to make the turn? I, yeah, I believe the question is, can they merge over into the left-hand turning lane and turn at the lights? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So the Motor Vehicle Act of British Columbia uh, does it, gives cyclists all the same rights and responsibilities as vehicles. Uh, cyclists are not considered vehicles, but we have the same rights and responsibilities. Uh, so that actually had, leaves a, a certain amount of gray area and um, the Motor Vehicle Act is somewhat outdated. It was introduced in the 50s. So there's there's room for improvements given the level of cyclists. Uh, and I say that because uh, one, what we would instruct for a cyclist to do what's called a vehicular left-hand turn, just being in the roadway, and if there's a left turn lane, you would want to be in the left turn lane to make a vehicular turn. Uh, the alternative is to do a pedestrian turn, which is to uh, use the crosswalks as he was talking about in this previous slide. Uh, the safest way to do that, uh, if there's a left-hand turn lane, you, you need to go into the left-hand turn, signal, shoulder check. Um, in, if there's not a left-hand turn lane and you're just turning left at the lights, the safest way to do that is to take the primary position and be in the center of the lane so that you don't, so that you're visible and you're not put at risk of a car uh, coming up beside you and turning right over you and getting the right hook situation that Karen was talking about. So if you're in the center of the lane, then cars are going to be behind or in front of you. Problem is, it is possible to get ticketed by uh, a bylaw, like a police or a bylaw enforcement officer, because that is gray in the Motor Vehicle Act. But it's what we advise cyclists to do because it's safest. Excellent, thank you, Lana. Um, 
There is another question, someone saying, I believe that, uh, I think they're referring to coming north north on wharf at that intersection where it turns into government. I believe that's pedestrian only now. Um, I think that might be true. I think that might've been a recent change, but definitely check out the signage there to see if you are allowed to ride your bike on that block of government street. Uh, yeah, and I, I think I referred to that, that government right. is now expanded pedestrian. And uh, I was saying that the, the signage is actually not explicit that cyclists mm -hmm. can mount and walk until you get to Ford Street. Right. Yeah. Just looking through the questions here, someone is asking, going southbound on Cook, turning left onto Finlayson. They're concerned that it requires um, merging two lanes over to get into the left turn lane, and there's a bit of a blind corner, and cars can come around pretty quick. Would anyone have any thoughts on the safest way to turn left from Cook to Finlayson? Who, who wants to take that? Um, I'm not familiar with the exact intersection, but I think a lot of what you just said, Lana, is probably true about taking the lane, making sure to shoulder check before merging, as it sounds like if I'm thinking of the right spot, moving over Cook to turn left onto Finlayson, perhaps there is not a totally safe way to do it beyond that. Karen, are you familiar with the spot? Yeah, I'm familiar with the spot. Um, I, I, it's hard. It's hard to know what to recommend. Um, mm -hmm. I have done that before, and I think you know a lot of this turns into having. We, you know, these these gaps, we end up having to take the lane as a cyclist, and you really you go from feeling pretty safe and comfortable to all of a sudden feeling pretty pretty prone and vulnerable. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I, I I think this highlights a lot of of you know what what happens when when the infrastructure stops or it's yeah it's not continuous. Um, and yeah, I think I would defer to Lana and Hugh or Todd, who are actual, you know, bike safety instructors as to what the best approach is. But I think that's the common thread is, you know, when the bike infrastructure stops, this is when you have to pretend you're a vehicle, which is it's really challenging. Mm -hmm. Lana, you're muted right now. Thank you. I would, I would just add to that. So, which way were they turning? Uh, left. On from Finlayson onto Cook. From Cook onto Finlayson, I believe. Yeah. <clears throat> For sure, if you want to make so the left-hand turn is always uh, more, almost always more complicated because there, you know there's traffic and there's um, multiple lanes here, and as the person asking the question pointed out there's there are multiple lanes so you're needing to shoulder check and signal and traffic can go pretty quickly there so it's it's either taking the lane and being uh, confident to do that my experience is if you plan it early and you shoulder check and you signal that uh, I find that and, and perhaps it's a confidence and experience the first time I'm sure is can be terrifying but with time I do find that, that if you communicate what you're going to do you're predictable that, that cars give you space they're not out to run you down uh, and, and the other thing is you may feel confident doing it at one time as I said about a different intersection Shelbourne and, and Bagby uh, but depending on the time of day how much traffic there is what the speed of the traffic is the light conditions is it flat light and it's winter that it's okay to, to choose this time I'm going to be a, doing it vehicular and another time I'm going to go for the crosswalk. There's Excellent. No thank you, Lana. I believe that's uh, all the questions we have. So thank you, everyone. Hugh, I apologize we didn't get to the last two of your intersections due to some technical difficulties, but I want to thank all our presenters. Lana, Hugh, Todd unfortunately had to leave after his presentation, and Karen from Bike Maps. So if I'm to plug anything at the end, I will say, check out bike maps, check out all of our neighborhood rides, which are available on the Greater Victoria Cycling Coalition page, and stay tuned for our next webinar, which you can find details about on our website. It's coming up next week, where we share some research on cycling in mid-sized cities. So thank you for everyone who attended, and 
I bid you adieu. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody.